Hi, I'm Dr. Bruce Hopler, the Executive Director of Church Strengthening for Converge. While this year 2020 has been undoubtedly challenging for everyone, it has been brutal for pastors. Uh, they've been trying to lead their congregation through massive and sudden change without warning and without a roadmap, really. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, they're finding oftentimes is they uh, will make decisions and then they have decision fatigue and they might even have a lot of uh, negativity below that from their own congregation who disagree with their decisions. Pastors are weary. They're tired, they're emotionally exhausted, and some are full-on burnout. And that's why we're doing these series of videos uh, that are geared towards the emotional health of a pastor. And each week I'll interview a, a pastor world leader to give uh, some practical wisdom and guidance. Today it's my honor to introduce to you Pastor Dan Nold of Calvary Church, an area that began in State College, uh, but then kind of expanded beyond that with his three campuses, Central PA, Penn State, some of you may know the area, there in our, uh, our Mid-Atlantic district. So uh, Pastor Dan, first of all, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, it's great to be here, Bruce. Yeah. So, uh, Pastor Dan, one of the things when you and I were talking about what, you know, what your specific topic would be, uh, I, I, I enjoyed that, uh, the topic, the title of leading from be still in the midst of a storm. Yeah. I think if we're going to talk about that, let's, let's kind of break that down a little bit. And so let's talk about the ending part of the statement. Tell me about the storm. Sure. Well, I, I mean, you, you already started kind of kind of talking about just the general storm that mm -hmm. I think leaders find themselves, not not just in the church, I mean, all over the place, but, but specifically as we talk about the church, I, I think, you know, the uncertainty is is a huge part of it. Um, our, our minds do not like uncertainty, and so we're working extra hard because there's always all these options out here of what we could do, should do, somebody wants us to do, shouldn't do, and, you know, all of that, and just the not just it's not just a decision making process that brings drain it's it's just feeling like you, you never have all the information and tomorrow the information might be different and and we're at the whims you know uh, more so than than maybe in in other years at, at what governments think or what you know people outside the church outside of our it's all outside of our control but outside of our control you know are thinking saying or doing and and so there's a, a lot of uncertainty and and mixed messages and you know i mean when leaders are trying to make decisions based on good information wise counsel and uh you know good information and wise counsel seems like it's saying the opposite or or 17 different things all at the same time i think that can just bring a, a weariness that's part of the decision fatigue and and uh you know part of the storm is is for, for me personally part of the storm um was i, I you know i think you know i've shared in a, a couple different settings that that for me, uh, part of the storm was was getting COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. Way back in, in March, um, I, I do some consulting for churches and missions organization. I was consulting for a, a, a mission organization out in the state of Washington, right across the river from Portland, and and uh, came home from that. And uh, two weeks later, was was uh, feeling you know the the, the mm -hmm. some of these symptoms and. Um, got an email from somebody in, in Vancouver saying, hey, just want you to know I tested positive and came down with it. And and uh, so I went and got tested and, and ended up having it. And so about a week into that um, kind of sickness, which, you know, was was much more mild w when I had it than a lot of people were going through. But I, I would say it was still the sickest two week mild I, I've ever experienced. Um, but, you know, in, in the midst of that, um, about a week into having the symptoms, you know, this is just right when things are starting to, you know, close down and stuff like that. And, and uh, I'm, I'm feeling in, in a lot of ways inadequate in part because of, of feeling cruddy, um, drained, all of that, and, and knowing that I need to lead my church, but in part because I was feeling like a lot of my peers, you know, in churches of, of my size, you know, I just felt like they're doing a lot better job. They're hitting it out of the park and, you know, this is going well and they're doing this and we're not doing that. And, and here I am, I'm, I'm sick. And, and I remember lying in bed and, you know, just doing a little bit of the why me wine to God and, and, and just really having that message really clearly given to me by the spirit. Um, 
be still. Stop striving. Uh, your, your, your problem is, Dan, you're still trying to control everything that you think you should control. And you think that the success is based on your capacities, your capabilities. And, and I've, I've got this. What, what you've been praying for. Um, I remember, you know, just getting that, that sense so strongly. What you've been praying for, I'm, I'm doing. Um, stop striving. And so, you know, those, those words that, that be still from, from Psalms, be still and know that I am God that really began to shape my perspective. And there were a number of places after that where, you know, I felt like I, I had a, a, you know, a, a point of, of Holy Spirit kind of saying, watch this, let this go, surrender this. And, and uh, I, you know, I think, I think those things in terms of being emotionally healthy, it, it had more to do with perspective than it had to do with just certain practices. But but, you know, there's, there's all of that in the storm. How's the church doing? And I'm not seeing the church. And I'm trying to lead in a whole different way. And at the same time, I'm trying to figure out what is God doing? Because I don't believe that this is a, a temporary interruption. I believe that it's a transitional disruption. And so as a leader, I'm trying to think through not just how do we make it through this, but, but really trying to dial in on, God, what are you doing? And, and what do you have for us in the next chapter? And, and uh, you know, so all of that stuff, kind of the physical and, and shepherding the people and making decisions and, and trying to figure out what's next, not just how do we make it through, because that for me is part of leading well. I mean, all of those things, I think, kind of become the storm. You know, Pastor Dan, if uh, I would encourage pastors right now, get out a pen and paper and write down two words, be still. Yeah. Uh, we... Uh, it's like we preach and we teach and we know that uh, we're to rely on the Spirit of God, uh, but we are naturally, as leaders, we tend to be strivers. Yeah. And as you said, uh, when you're in a time of uncertainty, that is just scary because your uh, foundation is just kind of being messed with. And yeah. we tend to get into the comparison game too, you know? Uh -huh. uh, it's uh, always there. I, I know most pastors fall into it innocently by just saying, well, Let's see what I can learn from the other churches. And next thing you know, they say, well, gosh, you're doing a lot better than me. <laughs> you know? yeah. So uh, I appreciate your humility in wrestling uh, with that. And uh, uh, so that right there, what's the price of admission, but let's dig into that a little bit more. Um, how, how do you find the be still place yeah. in the midst of the storm? Yeah, well, you know, it's recognizing that when, when Jesus said, be still, when God said, be still in Psalms, and, and even, you know, that you, you have that storm story in, in the scripture where Jesus says, be still to the storm. But, but, you know, so often, I think when we're thinking about what is stillness, we, we immediately go to, to non-activity, like, like, I got to be quiet, I got to be silent. And I think that's hugely important. You, you know, honestly, if, if pastors aren't, and this is a practice more than a perspective, but it leads to perspective, if pastors aren't, um, taking a Sabbath from social media, you know, headlines, mainstream media. I mean, we need to write some of our own headlines. There's some pretty good biblical headlines that, hmm. that, that are, are much better clickbait than some of the stuff, you know, that's out there. But that, that kind of silence is, is important too. But the Hebrew word, you know, in, in the Psalm for be still, it's, it's literally let your hands drop. Um, stop striving. Stop trying to hang on to you know, what you're not meant to hang on to. And, you know, that, I think those issues of control and, and comfort, you know, as leaders, we, we feel like that's, that's part of our calling, you know, is to be in control. How can I lead if I'm not in control? Whereas I think God is really looking for leaders who are willing to be out of control. And, and I don't mean by that to be reckless. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not risk adverse, but I, I, it's not, it's not a recklessness. It's, it's a surrender. And so for me, you know, that journey actually started more like seven years, uh, uh, seven, eight years ago when I, when I went through my uh, doctor of ministry studies and, and it was on uh, organic leadership development. And one of the concepts that was introduced to us from um, Bobby Clinton's writings was this concept of spiritual influence, spiritual authority. And, and uh, you know, we talked about how as leaders, we can lead from a number of different places. So we're all familiar about uh, positional authority. That's, that's the lowest basis, you know, kind. It, it's, I consider it a, a push me authority. It's, 
you're telling me what I have to do, what's the bare minimum. And it's just by virtue of the position I have. And then there's a leadership that comes from charisma or capacity. You know, it's my personality or it's my abilities. And, and you want to be around me because you see me getting stuff done or you like who I am. And so that's kind of a, a draw me along a leadership. It's a pull me leadership. Mm-hmm. But, but spiritual authority is not the authority you get because you're a pastor. That's positional authority. Um, spiritual authority is more like a dance. And, and when you see this kind of spiritual authority in someone, sometimes it's almost like you can't tell who's, who's leading, whether it's between that person and God or it's between that person and others. There's just this weaving together of, of motion and, and interaction. And, and spiritual authority, spiritual influence comes from going deeper with Jesus. It, it comes from letting him process the junk and, and allowing him to go deeper and, you know, being open uh, about who you are and where your stuff is. And, and, and it's, you know, the, the charismatics call it anointing. Um, but, but I think it actually goes deeper than anointing. It's more than just integrity and trust there's actually a, a smell of Jesus on somebody who has spiritual authority. And you just, you, you, you want to be with them, even if they don't accomplish anything, because you just, you sense something good there. And I think that's available to all of us, regardless of our skill level capacity. And, and, and so there's, there's three postures that, that lead us into that kind of spiritual influence, spiritual authority that take us deeper with Jesus. And, and one is the posture of surrender. And, and so, you know, when it comes to leadership, if that's the kind of authority we want, it's never about trying harder. It's always about surrendering more. I mean, I just, I, I feel like day by day, there's something new, whether it's something big or little, that, that is another step of surrender. And, and you know, new revelation almost always um, is preceded by surrender. You know, I, I just think surrender is, is, is one of those, it's not even so much I mean, I guess you could call it a discipline or a practice, but it's really a perspective of hands out saying, God, everything I have belongs to you. What do you want me to surrender today? At, at one of the points um, in, in these last few months, two different points in, in terms of surrender, I, I felt like God was saying, Dan, I want you to surrender the crowds. And at another point, I felt like you saying, I want you to surrender your voice. And, you know, to me, that doesn't mean I'm not going to be a pastor. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to leave. But, but there's a certain attachment that we have to what success looks like. And, and basically, I felt like God was saying, I want you to surrender those things that you're attaching your sense of success to. Um, then there's the posture. And, and surrender, the issue of surrender is always who's in control. You know, it's always answering, am I in control or is God in control? That, that's really the, the primary issue in question. Yeah. And then the posture of brokenness is, is the question of dependency. It's the question of what do I bring to the table? Do I bring to the table primarily my cap- capacities and cap- my abilities, or do I bring my desperate dependency on on God? And 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 uh, really, what Christ is looking for in leaders is is that desperate dependency, not not so much our abilities. I mean, you know, Jesus said in the parable of the talents, He can do more through our worst failures than we can do without Him through our success. He's the one who plants, who sows where He doesn't even plant, who, who excuse me, reaps where he doesn't even plant, you know, and, and, uh, and then the final one is the posture of vulnerability. And, and the posture of vulnerability is more that horizontal thing where, where it's all about me being able to say to others in my life, um, I actually need you more than you need me. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and because of that, it's not just about being authentic. It's not just about sharing my struggles. It's actually saying, I, I, I need you, you know, I, I need you to walk with me through this. Uh, I need others. I, I'm, I'm not just that solitary leader who can do it alone. So it, it kind of goes a little bit beyond um, authenticity. The vulnerability says, I, I actually need, says to my neighbors, I actually need you more than you need me. Says to God, obviously, says to people in the church, I actually probably need you more than you even need me. And I found as I try to live out those three postures, that's my greatest de-stressor, you know, in, in, in in times of, of the storm. It leads me to Jesus in the midst of the storm. You know, um, it just strikes me that uh, very little of the scriptures were written in stable, predictable times. Right, yeah. 
most of it was under the context of this is confusing, this is chaos, we're not in control. And so therefore, those three postures are one that those that were in tune with the Lord, uh, uh, they would somewhat also just make sense because they've had to do it so often. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm not so sure in our context that we've, we've known about them, but have we had to do them yeah. to the level that we've had to do them? And, yeah. uh, and I think it's, it's pretty revealing. They always say that crisis it doesn't create something new. It just reveals what's, what's, yeah. there, what's not there. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's just it's humbling to recognize that I need to invite brokenness, that I need to let go of control and all of that. So, uh, well, so other than these uh, postures and, uh, and all of that, what have been some of your best rhythms of help in the midst of the storm? Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's a number of things that, that I do. Um, you know, besides kind of taking on those postures and, and saying, okay, what do I need to surrender and reminding myself of my own brokenness. And, um, but, you know, I mean, there's some, there's some, uh, th there's some principles and there's some practices. So, you, you know, for me, one of the principles is just always remembering we're, we're in the midst of a battle. It's not a physical battle. It's, you know, it's spiritual. It's not against people. Recognizing where the source of the conflict comes from is always helpful to me. And, and that leads into prayer. I mean, I think, you know, in times of uncertainty and stress, in times of desperation and helplessness, um, O. Hallisby, who wrote one of the classic books on prayer, just entitled Prayer, said, um, your, your helplessness is your best prayer. You, you know, when our hearts feel that helplessness, that, that goes straight to the heart of God faster than any words that we can pray. And so, you, you know, coaching people and pushing people and leading people, our church into times of prayer during this season has been has been so critical. I mean, that that was at the very beginning in March. We we led people into a season of prayer. Um, we're, we're just finishing up 40 days of prayer, and and so for me personally, that's that's been that's been uh, such an important part of it. The the prayer rhythms. You know, I think another thing, just as as uh, practical as for Lynn and I, what we do on our day off is we get out of town. We we take a long drive. Hmm. In Pennsylvania, I know for some people listening to this, taking a drive in your city, you know, may not be that, um, may to be stress inducing, not, not relaxing. Um, but for us, getting out of town um, gets us away from the spiritual battle for a period of time, gets us away from the context. And, and a lot of times, even as we go, we're talking about church, not all the time, but a lot of times, but it's, it's just a whole different feel mm -hmm. when we're out of town. We're, we're kind of here in Pennsylvania. It's a gorgeous place. And so we're, we're seeing some of God's creation and we're reminded of the goodness of God's works. And um, so that's, that's been a really helpful part um, for, for Lynn and I as well. And uh, you know, I think, I think another practice is always pulling back from uh, trying to simplify complex issues. You, you know, I, I think our desire to simplify complex issues is just another place where we try to control. And, and, and if we can simplify it so that I can understand, I can decide whether this is right or wrong and you're good or bad, you know, and, 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 uh, and it's got to be 100% good or bad, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I think we, we should not try to simplify complex issues, but, but I do think there are simple practices that God calls us to that help us in the midst of complex issues. And, you know, love God and love your neighbor. Okay, I know that I'm called to do that in the midst of stressful, chaotic, leadership draining kind of times. And, and I think if I do that, um, that's going to help me, you know, with my emotional health, that's going to help me with my stress levels, because I'm, I'm on God's path, you know, and, and so finding some of those things, um, those, those simple next step kind of commandments, you know, just looking for the next step. I, you know, I feel like I have a better idea of where we might be a year from now than I have where we might be next week. And so I've, I've learned to surrender my, my uh, certainty and where we're going to be next week. And I'm really kind of focusing on what's further down the road. Wonderful. You know, uh, I was reflecting as you were talking that God has the ability to make the incredibly complex into simple. And we have the ability to take the yeah. very simple and make it incredibly complex. Yeah. And uh, so it almost begins to become a sign that you might 
be out of sync with the Lord when you're getting too entangled in the complexity of things yeah. and not just saying, okay, let me deconstruct that a little bit. Lord, what would you have me do? Yeah. And simple things with these steps, these practices, taking a nap, taking a drive, yeah. <laughs> you know, getting a getting alone with the Lord uh, and, uh, or just kind of working through or just taking things one at a piece at a time and yeah. recognizing we're not in control. Yeah. Yeah. You bet. So uh, could I ask you, there's going to be a lot of pastors who are going to be watching this and yeah. uh, some are in pain. Uh, yeah. Some have gone through some very difficult circumstances and they know that they need to put these in practices. They probably have written down multiple things uh, but again, cognitively knowing it and really surrendering to the spirit is difficult, can be a difficult thing at times. Would you end our time by praying for the pastors yeah. that are listening? Yeah, you bet. I'd be happy to, Bruce. We pray. Um, Father, I, I know that, uh, um, every pastor listening to this, you, you love them. Um, far beyond their imagination, um, the the love that they've preached about, um, the the peace that they've told others is available is is for them, and and I pray, um, first of all, maybe most importantly, that every leader listening to this would would have a little bit of that sense of of being like a little kid, um, who's guarded by um, his or her father's embrace and uh um, so so father I, I just start by saying thank you you are a good god you are a good father jesus you are a, an amazing king um, you are the king of the kingdom there is nothing going on in this world that that is beyond your scope that is beyond your knowledge that is beyond your ability holy spirit um the power that you empower us with the comfort that you comfort us with um, the, the, the way that you pray for us when we can't put it into words, um, it, it just goes beyond our imagination. You, you are too wonderful um, for words. And, and we rest in that hope. And we rest in the hope of Romans 8 that what we're going through um, cannot even begin to compare with the glory that one day will be revealed in, in us and through us. You, you are taking us to a place. This is not without purpose. It's not without direction. Um, there's something you're doing, not not just in our our own congregation, but globally, um, with with your body, Jesus. Globally, you are in the process of doing something, and with all my heart, I believe that you're taking us through a transition. And transitions are some of the most uncomfortable things that we can experience in the world. Um, but but those transitions are also times of catalytic spiritual growth. And so I pray that in our striving, we wouldn't miss that catalytic spiritual growth. God, I pray for every person listening to this, that you would um, do a deep work in them, um, that, that you'd kind of spiral it down, your grace and your word and, and, and your, your righteousness and your justice and your love, that, that all of that would become so woven in us. And, and in the process, Father, I just pray for each one of us that in our, our sense of desperation and brokenness, we, we would lean into prayer. That, that we'd become even more and more a people of prayer. And that, and that as we pray, as we sit even in silence with you, because we don't know what to pray, um, that your spirit would do that healing work in us, that rejuvenating work in us, that you would give us um, a peace that will guard our hearts, that you will um, strengthen and energize us for the task ahead. And God, I just, I pray especially as we close just for hope. Um, that you will just pour uh, your hope out upon your people, out upon your leaders, that, that they will know that you have good in store. Whenever we, we reach it, that's in your hand, Father, but, but you have good in store for your people. You have good in store for your kingdom, and uh, you, you got this. Um, there's nobody in the world um, who gives us a more certain, a more sure hope, even in the times of, of wavering uncertainty. And so we thank you for that. God, bless each person leading, bless each person listening um, with your presence. We, we don't want your power without your presence. We don't want impact without intimacy. We don't want achievement without access. 
And so, uh, Father, uh, distinguish us from all the people on the face of the earth by your presence. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, you bet.